and have your dessert and coffee ready as we bring our guest speaker to the podium, if I can get your attention for a couple minutes. Let me also welcome Councillor Josh Matlow, who joined us just a few moments ago. Great to have you here. A warm welcome. And now it's my pleasure to ask uh, Nathan from Hatchmott McDonald to come and uh, formally introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Carol. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our, uh, today's speaker. Uh, Bruce McQuaig has been uh, President and CEO of Metrolinx uh, since September 2010. Uh, Bruce has more than two decades of public service experience in the transportation and land use planning sectors. As Deputy Minister of Transportation, he was responsible for leading 4,000 public servants as they worked in to ensure Ontario's transportation system is efficient and safely moving people and goods. Bruce begins and brings the same leadership today as the head of Metrolinx. Prior to joining Ministry of Transportation, Bruce served in various capacities at the Ontario Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing for 10 years. At Metrolinx, Bruce is building a team that is committed to transforming transportation in the GTHA. He is committed to delivering on the province of the province promise of the big move, which is central to everything the organization does. As Carol said earlier, Bruce will share the exciting details about the next wave of projects needed to keep the wheels moving forward. I know this is a discussion we're all really keen to have. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Bruce McQuaig. Well, thank you very much, Nathan, for that introduction, and uh, thanks to the Board of Trade uh, for hosting me here today. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you people. I see so many friends and colleagues that I've worked with over the years, and uh, I'm very pleased that you made the time out of your busy schedules to, to join uh, me this afternoon and uh, going through a bit of a progress report on where we are. Um, now, I have a bit of a speech here, and uh, Melissa's in the back, and she's uh, manning the, uh, the, the, the button on the PowerPoint deck, so I have to stay pretty close to, to uh, what is outlined in the speech. Um, but I also wanted to just thank uh, my uh, colleague board members for being here today, Marianne McKenna, Doug Turnbull, Richard Corsell, uh, Metrolink's board of directors. Uh, I received great support from my board members, and uh, I thank you for being here today with me. Uh, Interestingly enough, speaking to the Board of Trade was my first public event after joining Metrolinx about two and a half years ago. I appreciated the warm welcome I received then, and I'm happy to return today to provide an update on our real progress in transforming the region's transportation system and set out some direction on where we're heading for the future. Let me just start off by saying that it's a critical and important leadership role that the Toronto Board of Trade has played on transportation issues. Carol Wilding said something very important in the Globe and Mail just last month when she noted that on re regional transit and transportation issues, we need to, and I quote here, drive discussion, drive debate, and drive a solution. Now, I couldn't agree more, and that's why I'm here today. But first, uh, let's just take a moment to think about how we all traveled here. Did you drive, take the subway? ride a bus or maybe a streetcar. Maybe you even took the GO train to today's event. Like you, I see and I feel firsthand that we have a congestion problem here in this region. When I ride the GO train and the TTC, I'm a simple transit customer. I'm walking to the station and waiting for the train. I'm trying to find a seat. I'm getting ready for my first meeting in the morning. In other words, I'm just like everyone else. I'm also reminded of our congestion challenges when I have to allot an hour and a half to drive to Pearson Airport to catch a flight. I hear about the challenges of traveling across the region from my friends, from my neighbors, my family members. I hear it from my spouse who talks to me about why does her 10 minute drive to the school that she teaches at every day become a 30 minute trip on a regular occasion. I know that all of you can relate to this experience. We see that our transportation system is straining. It's straining from a growing population and it's forcing the wheels of subways and trains, buses, trucks and cars to all but stop. 
Over the course of the next 20 years, 3 million more people, that's the size of Montreal, will join the ride here in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Depending upon what we do to address this congestion, we could, on average, end up spending as much as 109 minutes more in traffic every day. Now that's the length of a Hollywood movie, and I think if we got to that point, we would all agree it's a pretty bad Hollywood movie. A solution is needed that's as simple as the wheel itself, a plan designed to get all of our wheels moving once again. Well, I'm pleased to say that we do have a plan. It's called the Big Move. This award-winning plan is a culmination of years of strategic thinking and planning by Metrolinx, in partnership, of course, with municipalities and with the input from the public and from stakeholders. The Big Move is the blueprint for a more sustainable transportation future. It reaches out 25 years to guide and direct our decision making. It sets out a vision for a transportation system that is seamless, coordinated and efficient. A vision where all of our communities and neighbourhoods are served by more transportation choices. The big move gives us the plan where 75% of the region's population, not just Toronto's, but the region's population, lives within two kilometres of rapid transit. And transit's share of overall travel in the region doubles. It's a plan where the amount of rapid transit, including subways and trains, light rail transit and bus rapid transit in dedicated routes, is tripled. Now we all can agree that this is the kind of transportation system that this region needs to get all those wheels moving again. The Big Move also provides us with a roadmap for how to get there. This roadmap is now well underway with $16 billion in dedicated funding for transit and transportation priorities. Let me share a couple of examples. We're working with the City of Toronto and the TTC to revamp Union Station by 2015. This project will triple the size of the GO Transit concourses. It will also make the Union Station subway station a more comfortable experience for customers. Now I know that when we're down on Front Street these days, we see all the construction underway and it does look a bit of a mess, but the promise of that infrastructure investment is a very exciting one. And I think we're going to see that that's going to transform our most important transportation asset in this region. We also now have a master agreement with the TTC and the City of Toronto for the four new light rail tra transit lines in Toronto. And I see that Andy Byford is here and I, I thank him and uh, his colleagues for all the support and partnership that we've been able to build as we've developed this agreement. It gives us certainty on the path forward for these projects. A path that includes new light rail transit along Eglinton to Scarborough, along Shepherd East and along Finch West. Now in some places, this will reduce transit times for our customers by about 20 minutes each way. Now just think what we could all do if we had 40 minutes more in our already busy days. We've expanded GO train and bus services across the region. This has allowed ridership to grow by 6 or 7 percent each and every year. And let's make no mistake, most of the people that are on the GO system would otherwise be on their cars, in their cars, on our already congested roads and highways if they weren't on that uh, train or that bus. You see other examples of progress when you travel along Highway 7 in the region of York or Eglinton Avenue in Mississauga where dedicated bus rapid transit lines are under construction right now. And here's another significant step in executing our plan. We're implementing Presto, the regional fare card. With nine transit systems serving a population of six million people, Implementing Presto is one of the most complex fare card projects currently underway globally. Today, 400,000 cardholders travel throughout the region with a simple tap of their distinctive green Presto card. And we're adding 22,000 new Presto users each and every month. Now I use Presto to move around uh, the system myself. And because of this, I haven't bought a ticket or a token in over a year. I have it set up so that uh, my car reloads automatically value whenever it gets below a certain threshold. It makes it convenient and easy for me. I've also given Presto to my two daughters who commute to university. And uh, as, a, as a father, it's 
very uh, good to know that your kids always have value to get to school or even more important to get home at the end of the day. We have achieved another Presto milestone with yesterday's signing of the Master Agreement with the TTC. We now have an agreement on how the TTC and Metrolinx will work together to implement Presto across the rest of the subway, streetcar and bus systems in time for the Pan Am Games in 2015. There's much more work to do, but I believe that we are making progress and moving forward towards a truly integrated system with these and about 200 other projects that are underway right now. This represents the largest transit program in North America and will start the trans transformation and in fact start the renaissance of a best-in-class transit system that matches the needs of the, one of the world's most exciting city regions. Now this brings me to the first big piece of news that I'd like to share with you today. As many of you know, building a fast and efficient route from downtown to Pearson International Airport has been a priority project of the big move. I'm happy to say that we're on schedule to launch this service in 2015, the year we host the Pan Am Games. I'm delighted to share with you today the news that we have launched the new name for this service, the Union Pearson Express, or UP for short. Imagine when you have the option of avoiding that stressful drive in bumper to bumper traffic to make your flight on time. With UP, you sit back, plug in your laptop, connect to Wi-Fi, check out your flight time on the screen, or even check into your flight using an in-station kiosk, all before you arrive at Pearson, relaxed and on time. In addition to the great work on Presto and UP, today I'm pleased to make another announcement. We are going to update the big move and launch the next phase of our plan. We've been speaking with stakeholders and we've been conducting a technical review of the plan. The big move is now four years old and we need to make sure that it is up to date. The foundational vision, goals and objectives of the big move will not change. We are making the plan more relevant for today's and tomorrow's needs in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. In this update, we need to define some projects in greater detail, such as two-way, all-day GO Transit service. We also need to reflect all of the relevant studies that have been completed since 2008. As a result of this work, we have updated our list of priority projects and made some important changes to the timelines. The one that many of you are eager to hear about is a new connector line on the subway known by some as the Downtown Relief Line. It was originally identified in the big move for completion in the 15 to 25 year time horizon. I'm pleased to announce that we are planning to make this a priority project over the next 15 years. This means that we are advancing this project by up to 10 years. Now we're bringing forward this project because of a simple and a stark fact. Our subway system just can't manage the volumes of people trying to enter or exit the downtown area. Our customers know this, you know this, we all know this as we try to squeeze onto already crowded subway cars. We also know this because from our work on the Union 2031 study and our involvement with the city and the TTC on a report called the Downtown Rapid Transit Expansion Study, we found that the already crowded young subway is projected to experience a 25% increase in ridership by 2031. Now, can you imagine that, given what we know today? We also found that if we extend the Young Subway to Richmond Hill, which is also part of the Big Move plan, without a downtown relief line, the added demand would be too much for the Young Subway line. Now, if we don't get this right, we can't address the pressures that exist in the rest of the system. We can't get those wheels rolling. So while the relief line will be geographically located in the downtown area, its purpose is to open up possibilities throughout the region, such as the extension of the Young Line to Richmond Hill. We don't yet have all the answers for the downtown relief line. We need to complete more work with our partners on questions like the phasing, the alignment, and the different approaches that can be taken to serve both Toronto's and the overall region's transportation needs. 
but we do know that we have to get on with this work as part of our overall regional strategy. We're planning for the whole region. This region has long passed the point where we can plan for our transportation system municipality by municipality. There are simply too many connections across our integrated regional economy. To support this regional economy, our next wave of projects would include the following. First, Brampton Bus Rapid Transit, which will bring at least another 10 kilometers of upgraded transit along Queen Street in that city with a dedicated lane. Second, the Dundas Bus Rapid Transit project, which will help link Toronto, Mississauga, and Halton region with another 40 kilometers of transit. Third, 36 new kilometers of transit to connect Scarborough Centre through downtown Pickering to downtown Oshawa with the Durham-Scarborough Bus Rapid Transit Line. Fourth, the Hamilton Light Rail Transit Line, which will change the way people in Hamilton travel by connecting key areas such as McMaster University and the downtown core. Fifth, the Here Ontario Light Rail Transit Project with 23 kilometers of track, which will connect Port Credit through to Mississauga City Centre to downtown Brampton. Sixth, a new extension of the Young Subway from Finch Subway Station to Richmond Hill. And these projects are in addition to other initiatives such as GO two-way all-day service, electrification of some GO rail lines, and the new Subway Downtown Relief Line. We also need to make improvements to the local bus that picks us up at the end of our streets and to the roads that carry our buses, our cars, our bicycles, and our trucks. As such, as part of the next wave of projects in the big move, we plan to allocate up to 25% of our resources for local transit projects, for local roads, and for highways throughout the region. So what will your reaction be by the next wave of big move projects? How will your neighbours react? I think there's probably two reactions we can anticipate. First, people will ask the question, how will we pay for these projects? And second, is this real? Or is this just the latest in a series of transit plans we've heard of that never get built? Let me face these two questions head on. We anticipate the cost of the next wave of projects, as well as the funding for local transit, roads and highways, to be about $34 billion. Now that's a lot of money, but it will generate substantial economic benefits. The construction is estimated to create 800 to 900,000 jobs it will provide an infusion to our economy in the area of 110 to 130 billion dollars. But to make this work, to make the single largest investment in infrastructure in Canadian history, we need to think differently about how we fund infrastructure. We have benefited over the past few years from generous levels of investment from all levels of government. Provincial investment in particular is driving the current transit construction program. It is important to maintain these record investment levels, but they're not enough. At the same time, we can be fairly certain that expecting federal, provincial, and municipal governments to dramatically increase their investment will not be a successful strategy. With all levels of governments managing deficits, expecting more than current investment levels is not particularly realistic. As we move forward, and we will, uh, use partnerships with the private sector to build and operate the system where it makes sense and we can and we will protect the public interest. But in the end we still have to pay for these services, whoever builds them. We can also examine other funding options such as increased fares and efficiencies within the transit system. However, I don't believe that this would close the funding gap. So to make this happen, we need to continue to have a conversation a conversation with people and with business about how we can invest in our future. We need to discuss this because, in the end, we can't expect the money to come from anybody but ourselves. The world's other leading city regions have done this. Los Angeles, New York, London, Paris, Vancouver, to name just a few examples. In Los Angeles, for example, they have passed three different sales tax increases since 1980 that have allowed them to build their road and transit system to accommodate growing needs. New York 
uses a mix of income sources, from a sales tax to a gas tax, payroll tax, and a corporate income tax surcharge. London has used its congestion charge to dramatically change the way people use transportation in that region. Paris used payroll taxes to fund what many argue is the world's best transit system. And Vancouver, they use a suite of gas taxes, parking fees, utility fees, and property taxes to fund their system. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that any of these are the right solution for our region. In fact, there is no silver bullet. No perfect combination of revenue tools that we can adopt as our own. But we have found some common themes that we may want to consider as we think about the development of an investment strategy for this region. These common themes include, first, dedicating the revenue to specific projects and outcomes. In other words, the public wants to see exactly what they're paying for so that they can know the funds are not being diverted to other priorities. Second, fairness. Fairness in distributing costs to everyone who benefits. For example, everyone can agree that users need to contribute to infrastructure that will benefit them. But it is important to recognize that there are other groups and society in general who benefits from transportation infrastructure. We have to be fair in distributing the costs and benefits. Third, this sense of fairness needs to apply across the region. The entire region has significant infrastructure needs, and no part of the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area can be left behind. Fourth, transparency. It's critical in making decisions, administering funds, and reporting on results. As I said earlier, this big conversation has already started around the region, and this January, we'll be continuing this di the dialogue in a more formal way. We need each of you at the table for this discussion. Our discussions will form the core of answering the question of how we fund our future transportation system. Let's find a consensus among ourselves and with residents across the region that's impossible to ignore. Now, we will continue to reach out and engage with our stakeholders. We will continue to work with Civic Action whose What Would You Do With 32 campaign and Transit Champions Council is helping to raise awareness and push the discussion forward. I'd like to commend their work and echo what John Tory, the chair of Civic Action, recently said. It can be done so much better, and we want people to talk about how they would benefit from a greater investment to make it better. To make it better, we'll continue to work with many of you in this room and the Toronto Board of Trade as well as the Ontario Chamber of Commerce to tap into what the business community needs and wants from our transit and transportation system. We need to have a dialogue on this and then turn it into action. Each and every one of you in this room has a real vested interest in this dialogue and we know how much value you can bring to this discussion as we move forward. So I encourage you to be part of it, to lead the conversation within your community. We need to talk because we have a choice ahead of us. We need to make an active choice if we want our transportation system to be better. The great leaders and visionaries of this region from years past made some really big choices. Big choices that built the young subway in the 1950s, expanded Highway 401 in the 1960s, the 1967 pilot project that led to the creation of Go Transit. These are just some examples of the great choices that have been made in the past. Now is the time for our generation. We need to decide if we're committed to making the transportation system better across the GTHA, if we're pre prepared to leave our mark on this great region. The original big move was endorsed unanimously by all the GTHA municipalities five years ago. Now, we need your advice, your involvement, and your leadership to help us develop the comprehensive funding plan we need to submit to the province and municipalities by June of 2013. Here in the GTHA, we can cho choose a hopeful future that capitalizes on the pride that each and every one of us has for this great city, for this great region, the province, and the country. My, my ask of you is let us choose the path forward to tackle congestion 
and clear up our roads while building a strong economy, a healthy environment, and a vibrant quality of life for you and for your families. Working together, we can keep the wheels moving forward. Thank you.